uh, going through this series called Get Ready, um, where we're reading in 1 Peter how we're being called to be prepared. And sometimes we're caught unaware. Sometimes life gets busy and we're not really focused on what we're supposed to be doing. When I was in college, uh, you get all kinds of interesting jobs when you're in college. And so there was this school and they were pouring um, six, uh, well, there were three full, uh, full-size basketball courts in cement. It was outdoors. And they just had to wait for it to dry, and it was sort of like publicly accessible, so they were worried that someone was going to mess up the cement while it was curing. And so they asked me, they said, we want you to stay overnight and literally watch cement dry. Okay, that was the job. And, uh, and it, you know, it was like they put yellow tape, you know, around it, you know, so it looked like a crime scene. They were trying to really protect it. And I was like, I can totally do this. This is an awesome college job, right? I was like, this is how I'm going to handle it. Okay, there was a little building like right next to it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite over like 10 or 12 of my closest friends. And we're, I was like, hey, you guys got to come over. I have to stay up all night, right? We're, we're going to play board games. We're just, it's going to be like a party. It's going to be awesome. It's almost going to be like I'm not working. Uh, and so all my friends came over and we're playing, you know, board games. And, you know, maybe people go out to their car or run to get fast food. And one of my friends comes in like halfway through the night and just has like this look on their face. Like they had seen someone be murdered. And they look at me and I was like, what? What's going on? Someone walked through the cement. And I was like, no. Like, didn't they see the tape? Like, who does that? And not only like I was thinking, I, I, I get it. Sometimes we don't know that cement's wet, right? Maybe you walk out, you make a footprint. And you're like, oh, that's wet. I'm going to go around. This person was committed to the path they were on. <laughs> All the way across the basketball courts. And I was like, oh, my goodness. This is, I, this is, I failed. I failed. I didn't do my job. I was focused on something else than other than what God, well, not in that moment, what God was calling me to do, what my employer was calling me to do. I was looking back and I was like, did they pay me for that? Because they really shouldn't have. It was complete and utter failure on my part. God calls us to be alert and actively involved in his redemption work. I was looking at this passage and it didn't really, you know how some passages just like jump out to you and I'm like, yes. And this one I was like, eh, meh. Because a lot of it, I think like there's these platitudes, like these words in here that we just use so often that they kind of, lose their significance or their importance. In, in verse 7 in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says, the end of all things is near. When anyone ever tells you that, you know whatever coming, is coming next is important, right? He's saying we don't have a lot of time to act. This is the time when we rise up and we get involved. And I don't know, you know, when Jesus is coming back. I don't know that it's going to be next Friday or anything like that. I know that my time to be involved in the work that God is doing is short. I know that I don't personally have a lot of time. There is an urgency where life just goes by. And, and you realize that the time is gone that you had. And we're being called to do something, be involved in something that is monumental when it comes to the redemption work that God is doing. He says, therefore, be alert. So I'm like, okay, I can do this. I failed at this before. I'm going to try again, right? And, and of sober mind so that you may pray. And when it says sober mind, I mean, obviously, like not drinking, but that's not what he's talking about. I know some of you guys are like, man, my best prayers were when I was drunk. And uh, being of a sober mind, just being, thinking about things in a way that has truth in mind. When we gather and we talk about God's words, it reminds us. And here for me was really the letdown the first time I read it. It says, so that you may pray. I'm like, really? I got all excited. Like the first two thirds of this verse, I was like, alert, be a sober mind so that you can pray. I was like, pray, really? I'm not saying it's not important, but like, do we really need to get all excited about this? Uh, it's interesting talking to different people at the church and just in different groups and, and certain people have this like mindset. It was like, well, you know, I, I pray when I can, but 
I mean, God's going to do what God's going to do, right? I mean, prayer is just more really about me pouring my heart out or trying to understand God or, but you know, God's going to do what he's going to do. And I, and I just trust that whatever he is going to do is right. I hear people, I'm like, wow, that's like, it sounds really good. Like, man, they have like, their faith is better than me. Like, you know, I pray about everything. I'm always trying to, and, uh, and then it's like, wow, maybe I should be more like that. Well, I just, but I, I looked in the Bible and I just didn't find that that's what it says. Nowhere in the Bible is the verse where God says, pray, don't pray, whatever, I'm going to do what I want. It's, 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 that's not in the Bible, right? That would be the message translation if it was. Uh, but it's not in the Bible. Throughout the entire Bible, from Genesis and Revelation, he's calling us to pray. And not just because he likes to give out busy work, because it says that he will respond to it. God responds to our prayers. It says, ask and it will be given to you, right? Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. In, in the story of Sodom and, and Gomorrah, there's this dialogue between God and Abraham where God says, what if there's 50 righteous people, God? What if there's 40? What, what if there's 30? What if, what if there's 10? There's this response to Abraham's prayer. God doesn't just say, you know what? This is what I was going to do, Abraham, so just get on board and get out of the way. He's listening to the prayers of a righteous man. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Do we, do, do we look at prayer as this vital thing? And not only that, that prayer is a thing that if we get on our knees can transform the world around us because God hears our prayer. You know, sometimes God hears your prayer even when it's not his will. In, in Samuel, we read the story, right, where Samuel, he's getting old and he's got crazy kids. His kids are not like Samuel. And Israel like, is worried. They're like, I don't know, but this is, does not, this is not going to go good. And so they come to Samuel and they're like, Samuel, you know, I know we tried this whole priest thing and, and you were cool. Like, we liked you. That was great. But your kids, we are not ready for this. So can like, let's have a plan B. Can you go back to God and just ask for a king like this, a normal king, like all the other nations have kings and and this is kind of weird. And can you go? And Samuel's worried and he's like, oh man, I'm going to go to God and like, and God tells Samuel, right, don't worry. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And this is the point, right, where God says, so I don't care what their prayer is. I'm going to do what I want, right? God says, give them what they want. Give them the king they want. But warn them. Warn them. You know what? If you didn't like having a kind and gracious God as a king and you want a man, he will enslave your children. He will enslave you. He will take all of your possessions, all of your belongings. And that point in the story, the Israelites said, you know what, God, those are some really good points. We change our mind. No, they said, yes, sign us up for that, right? And God says, okay. In Romans chapter one, right? It says that we know God, that from the beginning of time, his invisible qualities, his divine nature has been apparent. And that men exchange the wisdom of God for the foolishness of men. And God shut it down. No, it says, and God gave them exactly what they wanted. He gave them over to the foolishness of their sin. And they received the due penalty of that. If you think that God's will just unfolds, you don't understand free will. This is the whole story. That God loves us so much that he allows us to choose. And however much or little we invite God into our lives, we invite God into our church, we invite God into our nation, matters. How much we as a church pray matters. What we ask God for matters. When we were pregnant with our first child, and that's just like, whoa, like, we, first of all, we didn't plan any of our children, so it was like, whoa, we're having a child. Uh, this is good, right? We're excited. 
uh, and my wife, none, none of the pregnancies were easy. And so the first pregnancy, and she's having difficulty, and um, so I take her to the emergency room. And we have this doctor, and she's explaining what's going on. And uh, if, oh my goodness, if any of you are in the medical profession, bedside manner, there should be like at least four semesters of just that. <laughs> this guy comes, and just like it's a fact, right, just listens to what's happening, and he says, oh, you're having a miscarriage, and walks out of the room, and like your heart and I was like, no. And I got down on my knees and I prayed. And I prayed and I asked God, like I've never asked for anything before or probably since. And that was, and that was our first child, Micah, who was born healthy and happy. And to this day, I don't know if I had an incompetent doctor or if God divinely intervened. But I do know that it was important enough to me that I got on my knees and prayed. God's not calling you just to sit by and accept whatever is happening. He's calling you to take what is important and bring it before him in prayer. The second thing... Uh, that I'm like, it's kind, of, it's kind of a platitude, like, gosh, oh, is there ever more in the history of man an overword used more than love? Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. <clears throat> and I'll be honest, the first time I read that, I was like, yes, I know, love each other, I know all about this. I was watching the YouTube uh, video from this guy whose name is Rabbi Twersky, and he was telling a story about another rabbi who was interacting with this young kid. And this rabbi asked his kid, like, what are you doing? The kid says, I'm eating fish. And, uh, and the rabbi says, why are you eating fish? And he says, because I love fish. And the rabbi says, you love fish? Like, so you put a hook in the water, caught this creature in his mouth, pulled him out, removed all of his internal organs, filleted him and boiled him in a pan. And you're telling me that you love fish? You don't love fish. <laughs> if someone tries to do that to you, they do not love. They love the, he says, you love the taste of fish, but you don't love fish. So much of what we see and love in our world, right, is we love what people do for us. But we don't love. In the lesser known John 3.16, it says, this is how we know what love is. This is the definition. Like, I'm going to give you the definition of love right now. It's different from what the world says. This is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to be willing to do the same. I'll tell you the, the, the most romantic story that I know. And uh, again, probably maybe transform your idea of romance too because there's no roses or chocolates in this story. And by the way, Valentine's Day was last Wednesday and if you're just figuring that out, it's too late for you. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm dating, uh, dating my girlfriend, you know, who, you know, this was before, before the, the kids. I, told, I wasn't planning on telling this story in the first service and I told them and now I feel like if I don't tell you it's unfair so I'm gonna tell you and this has nothing to do with the sermon. But uh, <laughs> when we first came to this church, it's just about this timeline thing. When we first came to this church, you know, I don't know, you guys are new and they have you, like you fill out a thing online and they ask you questions like, oh, you know, when's your anniversary and all that stuff and I'm like, oh, they wanna get to know you. And the reason they're asking you this, and I don't know if you guys know this, but this thing comes out, and it's like, you, you can, oh, congratulate so-and-so on this many years of marriage and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm filling it out, and I didn't know that this was going to, you know, be a thing. Me and my wife were married on 11-11-2000, okay? I'm online, I'm filling things out, and I got a little 11 happy. It happens. So I put 11-11-11, okay? <laughs> Which was after all of our children were born. Uh, <laughs> So the newsletter comes from the church, right? And it's like, congratulations to Kevin and Jelana for their three years of marriage, you know? And my wife's like, oh my goodness, she's freaking out. Like, she's like, oh, they think we have all these illegitimate children. And I was like, it's like, don't worry, they're proud of you. You stuck it out, you stayed with him. 
She's like, that's not what happened. I was like, nobody even knows who you are. I'll fix it, I'll fix it. I'll get on there and fix it. That has nothing to do with anything. Um, so, so we're dating and uh, we have this great, uh, it's like one of those group dates. We're supposed to meet our college group at Disneyland. So it's gonna be a great day. I, I'm taking this girl and I'm gonna hang out with her and, and you know, we're still in the getting to know th- each other face where it's like, you know, I don't, she probably like, yeah, I'll hang out with you as long as 12 other people are around. And so uh, we plan to meet like the college group at Disneyland. And so we're driving together and we're driving there. And I'm like, oh man, I'm like, I don't know if I'm just nervous or, or what's going on. Like I just, I, you know, I feel all tense. I just shake this off. I got, got this beautiful girl. It's going to be a great day. Disneyland, right? So we get to Disneyland and um, so this was the time before cell phones. So um, you had to tell someone um, where to meet you and then you had to actually be there. Um, so, we, so we were like, okay, we got to meet the group at this time at this place, you know, in front of the castle. And, and, uh, and so we're meeting up this group and, and our friends start talking. And to me, it's just like, all I hear is wah, wah. And I was like, I don't know what's happening. There is two entities, whatever you want to call them, political factions in my stomach. And they are not happy with each other. And I was like, I looked at her, we were like, we'd been there for half an hour, we haven't gone on anything. And I grabbed her hand and I was like, we need to leave. Because I don't know if your body has ever exploded. <laughs> but Disneyland is not the place where you want this to happen, right? It's a happy place, I want it to stay that way. And so I was like, we need to leave. And she's like, okay, we're driving. And at my goal, right, I'm like, I'm going to make it all the way to my house, right, and be in the privacy of my own bathroom, what every man wants, right? And I look at her and I said, we are not going to make it. We have to go to plan B, find the nearest gas station. So she pulls into this gas station, right? And I was like, I don't know, hopefully your body cooperates with you more. My body seizes up. I'm sitting in the car and she's like, okay, we're here, get out. And I was like, I can't. I had a can of Sprite in my hand that she had got me and I couldn't let go of it. She removes it out of my hand, helps me walk to the bathroom, right? And I did not make it. We're in a public bathroom in a gas station and I made it worse somehow. And she looks at me and, she's, and she puts me back in the car and she says, stay here, I'm going to clean this up. And I said, I think this girl loves me. <laughs> Who, what girl in their right mind would leave Disneyland half an hour into the day? No. This is what love is. <laughs> you guys are laughing, so I'll give you a couple more years of marriage. <laughs> God cleans up your filthy mess and takes a sick, diseased person like you and cleans you up. Yeah. He- He takes on the shame and the burden of your sin. The love that God is talking about is transforming. It's a platitude. And when we're talking about loving people like this, this is a radical concept. And he goes on and says, um, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And I'm like, hospitality, really? Is there anything more mundane? And like, because when I think about hospitality, it's this idea of like, you know, American hospitality, where like people are coming over and so you're like, quick, get out the Lorna Dunes and coffee. Like, we don't want to seem like savages, you know? And we're like, it is like without grumbling. And I'm like, who grumbles about that? Like, who does that? Um, But have you ever been anywhere else other than America and, and received hospitality? Because it looks a lot different. When our friends call us and are like, oh, you know, I'm going to be in town. You know, can I stay with you for like a week or so? And you're like, really? Like, you can't afford a hotel? I mean, you're thinking that. You're not saying it. (laughs) 
But you're like, oh, sure, sure, like, you can stay here. Like, you know, I'll, I'll pull out the futon or I'll borrow an air mattress, you know, and I'll move some stuff and you can sleep in the den, you know, next to the dog bed. And, uh, you know, <laughs> well, let's just sit at the table. And, you know, we're not savages. You go to other countries, other cultures, they will get out of their bed. They will give you the best bed in the house and they will sleep on the couch. And you'll be like, no, no. And they'll be like, no, we insist. You're our guest. You're staying here. At meals, you will sit at the head of the table. And when they serve, you will get more food than anyone else. And in case you're wondering, they don't normally eat like this. This is all for you. This is hospitality. This is making a stranger feel welcome in a strange place. And it goes on to say, and this is the part where I was like, okay, something strange is happening in this passage that I'd never have thought about before. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. When you're using your gifts you are showing God's grace to someone else. We were talking with one of our friends and uh, we were inviting her to church today uh, because, you know, I wanted, to, I'll be honest, I wanted her to hear, hear me speak because I'm awesome. Uh, <laughs> and she was like, uh, she was like, she's not here today, so the story's even funnier. She was like, uh, She's like, really, like, can't I just watch this? Like, isn't it on? I can watch it later. And I was like, yes, you can. Like, you can watch it later, right? You can, you can watch it, and you will be blessed by Dan or whoever is bringing the message. You will receive, you will hear God's word of grace for you. And you'll feel like, you know what? I got something out of church. But you didn't do that for anybody else. If God has given you grace... Is there anyone else in this room that has received grace? Is there anyone else who was, who was a wretched sinner and only stands redeemed because of the love of God? And the only way God says in that moment, I was given grace, and not just in the way that, oh, I have grace, great, that's awesome for me. No, you're a steward of that grace, and you are to give it to other people. And even in the little things, the things that seem mundane, to you, show people the love and the grace of God. Have any of you ever been to church? And maybe not today, but on a Sunday when Dan was speaking, you felt the grace of God in the word of God. Have any of you ever been in worship and with the songs and when the worship team felt the grace and the love of God? Have any of you ever, when you came to church and walked through the doors and you didn't know if you belonged or if anyone would accept you and someone said welcome and showed you a seat, did you feel the grace and the love of God? We do this as a church. You can't do this on your own. If you're just coming on Sunday, you're missing a huge part of what God's calling you to do. And when we talk about get ready, get ready. To God calling you to more. You need to be in a life group. You need to be using the gifts that you have to administer the grace of God to other people. You need to think that in any way that anyone has helped you along your path to grow closer to God or comforted you in a time that was difficult, that is now your turn to do that for somebody else. When I was a youth pastor, I had um, this girl that came in to the ninth grade. In the eighth grade, she lost her father. She came into group and was not feeling it. Came a couple times, left. Started drinking and partying. And I thought, I'll never see this girl again. She went out one Saturday night, got wasted and had one of her friends drive her home. Except she was so drunk that she couldn't remember where she lived. So her friend, wanting her out of the car, just dropped her off on whatever street corner she could make out. And she stumbled out, 
walked up onto this porch of this random person's house, her clothes disheveled and totally sick, and rang the doorbell. And do you know that that doorbell, by no coincidence at all, was mine? That by a random series of events, her drunk friend dropped her off at her youth pastor's house on a Sunday morning when I was trying to get ready to go and teach. And I opened the door and I realized I knew this girl and I brought her in And I didn't need to say anything about her choices because she already knew. And we put her on the couch and we made her some coffee. And I left. My wife prayed for her and got her home safely. We're ministers of God's grace. This is what we're called to do. This is what we as a church are called to do. He goes on to say, if if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. And trust me, like I feel the burden of that when I'm up here. I'm like, oh no, this is not. All of these are not the words of God. (laughs) Trust me. Especially the throw up story. God would never say that. (laughs) He'd be more politically correct. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. In this world that we live in, God is calling us to be a light that shines in the darkness. We, as the church, cannot just look at the world around us and say, this is all horrible. And we are the hands and the feet of God. I know the task seems overwhelming and you don't seem like you're prepared. But God says, don't worry, I will be with you. I will give you the words to say, but I need you to go. I need you to put yourself in a location with people that need to hear and feel and experience the love and the grace of God. We need to pray because prayer changes things. We are not helpless bystanders in a crumbling world. We are the active agent of God to bring the light and the good news of the gospel to those people around us. Wherever we see something that is not the way that it should be, that is our call to action, to respond to it and move out. When we start talking about this kind of faith, I don't know about you, but I get nervous. I'm like, this is huge. I don't think I can do this. Like showing up to church, I can do. (laughs) But this seems a lot more participatory. (laughs) I think the series is very timely and God is saying, get ready. We should expect that God is going to do something here in this church, here in this place. We need to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life. Your kingdom come, your will be done in this church. Your kingdom come, your will be done in this nation. We do not accept things as they are We hope and we pray for them to be changed by the grace and the intervention of our God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, we come to you in prayer. And Lord, in this this season of Lent, that we would be able to put something aside that occupies our time and supplant that with prayer to you that we would make our hearts known to you, God, and that things would not remain the same. Nothing remains the same when we pray. Lives are transformed when we pray. Communities are transformed when we pray. God, would this be not an age just like any other? Would this be an age where we as a church, as Life Bible Fellowship Church specifically, respond to your 
call. Take up our petitions. Present them to the Lord. And even in our doubt, when we say, I don't know if God can do this, will we be prepared to stand back and be amazed, God, at who you are and what you're going to do? We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.